Joining me for the afternoon update today is Liz Dunphy, the senior reporter with the Irish Examiner, and Gráinne Nye is a news reporter with the Press Association. Uh, you're both very welcome. Thanks Hello. a million uh, for coming into studio. Um, I, I mentioned uh, the issue of, of housing Ukrainian refugees, uh, the issue of housing refugees and asylum seekers um, writ large, Gronia is something I suspect we're going to be talking about all year and talking about in the context of Ross Gray today. Oh my God, it's every week there is a new example or, or a new flashpoint for this um, for this topic and uh, it happens to coincide with a bumper year of votes in terms of um, local and Europeans and most likely a general election, I'd say, despite what the ministers are telling us. So um, the doll is not back yet. This is going to overtake politics, I would say, this year, um, depending on, on there, it looks like there will be no slowdown in the number of people fleeing here, um, though the governments have said they do expect you, the number of Ukrainians arriving here to reduce after they pared back the supports that are being offered just 90 days accommod- of state accommodation anyway. Um, that they are uh, offering to arriving Ukrainians uh, and, and and that needs to go before the doll. Um, one of the first things that will, that will be, be, I suppose, discussed. So, the, so that is going to kind of, I think, kick off what, where the debate goes from there. Um, in terms of uh, refugees and asylum seekers, Roderick O'Gorman said over Christmas that 15,000 applications a, a year is going to be a, the new norm. And, you know, we, we heard in the news bulletins today the bombing of, of uh, Yemen um, uh, by the US and the UK in a sign of further kind of instability, to say the best, to, the best kind of mm. way to sum it up that is around the world. And all indications are that that is going to continue and that is going, that kind of instability is going to fuel arrivals to Ireland, a wealthy country that is, um, you know, far away from Russia in the, in the case of Ukrainians and uh, is at capacity in terms of um, employment, which is an attractive offer for, for migrants. Mm. But uh, obviously for asylum seekers, it's a neutral, safe country on the edge of Europe. Uh, the question of, of where to accommodate all of these uh, people is who are coming here, uh, you know, it's been a difficult one, understandably, given the sheer scale of the numbers for government uh, to grapple with. And before... Uh, Vladimir Putin invaded um, Ukraine. The big plan was for these uh, dedicated reception centres to be built uh, by the government. This was Roderick O'Gorman's plan. That obviously kind of went on the back burner for a while, but he's been out as well in the last couple of weeks reiterating that that is still the plan and they hope to actually get that plan seriously underway this year. That is the plan, but the government is definitely still very much firefighting and I suppose what choice do they have? You know, as Grania has said so eloquently, like we do, we have, you know, we we have a lot of there are a lot of people internationally that are you know desperately looking for uh, somebody out somewhere else to go. Like the Department of Integration released new figures today, which showed that there are now five hundred and sixty nine people, like international protection applicants, who've arrived into Ireland who now have no accommodation. Um, and you know, as we've seen in Ross Cray today. Uh, where, you know, this hotel, the Racket Hall, um, was to be used for, I think it was 150 asylum seekers. There are protests now outside there today with locals saying, no, they said that there's, I think there's something like 600 um, Ukrainians and people seeking refuge from abroad that are in Ross Cray already. And they said that there's there's just no space there. They said that that was their only functioning hotel. But we need, we need places immediately. And it's great that, you know, Roger Gorman is now talking about like a more or long term kind of like solution to the problem. But the reality is that we need places straight away to get people off the streets. There are literally people on the streets. We know that the temperatures are going to be plummeting next mm-hmm. week. And we had our first homeless death of the week, um, of the year this week. Uh, so, you know, it's really a crisis. It is a crisis as well that until you get those dedicated reception centres, uh, Gronya, you, mm. you're going to keep running into local opposition, aren't you? Mm-hmm. I mean, there's, there's no suggestion that this is abating whatsoever. If anything, the experience of Ballinrobe and Carlo, even though I know the government are suggesting there was no U-turn, there was never a plan to to, to put single men into these buildings. Um, as you know, working in politics and around politics, perception is reality. Yeah. And if the perception of protesters and the broader public is that the protest leads to acquiescence from the government, then people will do it. Uh, if you're explaining, you're losing is the other uh, uh, often used example there. But I think there's a there's a couple of things at play here. One is that um, protesters see other protests happening, so it's more acceptable because it's happening in, in a number of locations. Uh, another is that um, 
that there is general dissatisfaction with the government over, you know, housing in general, not just um, emergency accommodation, but affordability of housing is something the government hasn't actually grappled with. And this is a very obvious way of the government or of, of local people kind of um, voice. It's a, it's a flashpoint or a lightning rod, I suppose, for that. Some of that dissatisfaction. Another thing is that we've heard about again and again is the disconnect between Dublin and rural Ireland that the government has kind of, um, you know, folk, I suppose, hasn't... It, It is perceived that they have not invested enough in rural Ireland and rural services. And a lot of uh, locals say the first, you know, they feel the first time that they are hearing for the government or seeing any kind of government, central government involvement in their communities is to put more people there without actually um, helping their area grow or expand, which is why it's so irritating for them that, oh, now you're paying attention to us when you're using us to help you deal with a big problem without actually um, working with us when we when we need you. I think that is part of the frustration there. And I think that is why the elections this year are going to be so interesting. How mm. dissatisfied are people around the country with the current government or not? Like we might see the opposite. We might see that the, the protests are a, a vocal minority. We, we I actually am not sure myself about how how people stand. You know, we saw a huge vote for Sinn Féin, which were change, uh, uh, the party for change and offering change. I'm not sure how people feel three, four years on if this is dissatisfaction with this one issue or if it's a wider thing than that and that they are corralling around this issue to voice that dissatisfaction. I I mean, one would suspect, Liz, that uh, politicians at the national level would be paying very close attention to how local politicians who, who have taken a stand on this you know, on the side of local communities, as they would describe it, and against the housing of refugees or asylum seekers, how well they do in elections. And if they do well, I mean, the temptation, the political temptation will be there to echo some of their talking points when you seek re-election yourself for the doll. I think the local elections are definitely going to be a real kind of bellwether, I suppose, about how much support there really is out there for this kind of populist movement. And like Ireland, you know, it's it's easy. I think a lot of people will potentially be um, not so, be reticent to kind of voice their support for some of these movements in public, perhaps. But in the privacy of the ballot box, you know, how many people will tick, you know, my first preference for ex um, local councillor who was saying that, you know, he doesn't want any more immigrants in my mm-hmm. community. But also Ireland isn't alone in this. Like there's a wave of the this populism sweeping across Europe. You know, we've seen Gert Wilders, who was once such a um, sideline figure who in being getting a major mandate in Holland, um, like he is outwardly and unashamedly xenophobic, racist, and he is now potentially leading Holland. You know, we still see a lot of support for the Law and Justice Party in Poland. Um, it was in, in government for, I think, eight years and it still had more than 30% of the vote in the recent elections. And the more moderate Donald Tusk looks like they couldn't form a parliamentary majority. They didn't have enough votes for that. Mm. So it looks like they won't be in government again. But there's there's a lot of, you know, Georgia Maloney in, in Italy, um, Marine Le Pen in France. She's inching ever closer to the Elysee Palace. The President Macron's government had to rely on her party to get an immigration bill through recently, which made it more hardline. So these parties are having real influence on policy. I mean, Mm. Viktor Orban in Hungary has been systematically um, dismantling democratic institutions, essentially, you know, suppressing press freedom, judicial independence, minority rights. Um, So it's part of this wider um, wave across Europe. And so it's not just the locals, it's also the European. And, and to bring that, it back to the local then, uh, Gráinne, I mean, that there's, a, there's a rent-a-racist crowd doing a tour of the country. There absolutely is. And, and people give out when you point it out, but it is a reality. Uh, there are local people and you can understand in some areas, and I don't know Ross Gray well enough to know if this is the case, but there are areas where there there has been kind of um, more refugees and asylum seekers place their kind of per head of population than elsewhere. So you can see why maybe they say this is our only hotel, you know, where do we go for communions and confirmations or christenings, whatever it happens to be. And that's fine to a degree. And, you know, protest is meant to be disruptive and you have to be very nervous about any attempt to curtail it. But this talk in Ross Grey about blockading the road if a bus turns up with asylum seekers on it. I mean, if I walk out of this studio and stand in the middle of the street and claim I'm kind of protesting against some government action, the guards wouldn't be slow about moving me. 
Mm-hmm. And you know, we've seen this in other areas, a real reluctance in the guards to get involved in this yeah. and to move people off the kind of the public highway. In one case, it was it in Clare where people actually got on a bus and asked people for their papers. I mean, that is the job. That isn't even the job of the guards. What am I talking about? No. The guards can't ask for your papers. No. Joe Soap down the road certainly can't. Yeah, um, there's a couple of things there. So one is that the Gardaí have taken approach that um, to be more aggressive in policing these protests would do more harm than good. And that really came under the spotlight uh, after the the Dublin riots, you know, that they that they kind of there was something brewing from the afternoon there and they took a hands off approach to it. And I suppose the worst case scenario came to realisation there. But but there was criticism of that policy or that approach long before that as well, that it, that it wasn't fair, basically, that when you have protests you know, in relation to the many issues that there are in Dublin, housing, cost of living, you know, Palestine protests, that they were more, they appeared to me more hands on um, or more um, proactive maybe than in relation to to these protests and that that seems to be still the case um the the thing about the the kind of attacks on vacant properties or whatever about um, or hotels that are still in use you mentioned that might be used by the community ones that have been vacant for a while and that you know in the middle of a homelessness crisis that that, that you would destroy that is incredible mm. and like that that this is the thing that is galvanizing people when we have 12, 13,000 people who are homeless. This is the thing that people are getting annoyed about, I find quite extraordinary. Um, so when you say the rent races crowd, there are people who are stoking fears. They are not local people. I hear in Vox Pops with people where they acknowledge this. There are people who we don't know here talking about this thing. Mm. That it, that, is a, that is a thread running through this. And I think local people who do have genuine concerns need to be so uh, aware of that that they like and uh, maybe ask or just be aware that am I being manipulated here by someone? Because if you're if someone is saying to you you should be afraid of this that and the other, that is a form of m- manipulation as old as time. Um, listen, uh, we said right at the outset it's going to be the big issue of the year. We're going to be talking about it again, so we might move on uh, for the moment. Uh, talk about something completely different: uh, cycling. Are either of you cyclists in the city? No. I have no. no coordination. No, you don't need to be coordinated, Grania, <laughs> to cycle. If you can walk. I saw you walked into this studio. That she walks very well. <laughs> I can attest to that. One foot in front of the other. That is a weak excuse. <laughs> Liz? Um, I live at the top of a hill, so... Ah, oh, no, weak excuse. <laughs> but I've been meaning to get a bike, but I don't have one at the moment. So uh, three and a half thousand kilometres of new bike lanes are going to be rolled out uh, around the country. We're going to be hearing a little bit later this hour from Josh Crosby. He's been speaking to cyclists and drivers uh, uh, and other stakeholders as well. And just it's kind of it's it's amazing how this kind of divides opinion. The idea of investing in cycle lanes. Um, I did see on my way in here though, Liz. Uh, is it Dolphin Road? Is that the road along the canal? Basically, at Dolphin's Barn. Anyway, the road along the canal at Dolphin's Barn. They were putting down uh, flower kind of long flower pots as dividers between the cycle lane and the road. Which is a great, this is my big bugbear. Those wands are the ugliest thing in the world, <laughs> aren't they? We all agree on that. I haven't the, seen them. The <laughs> wands, the little, the kind of plastic wands on the side of the road. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. They're hideous. They're hideous, yeah. They're absolutely and hideous. And not environmentally sustainable either. If we are going in that direction with bike lanes, then we shouldn't really be using big, ugly plastic things, should we, which are just going into landfill quite, ultimately. Quite dangerous, mm-hmm. you know, like if you, if something happens in the road and you need to move to kind of avoid avoid it you're limited you're somewhat limited mm. you know you might but cars are not limited because they snap back up so a car can still go yeah. into the cycle lane and mow yeah. you down pretty easily I, d- I don't think that. I think they're kind of like a halfway house being like maybe we mm. should put an island here but we're not committed to doing that <laughs> so we'll just throw these things up instead what would make you cycle and don't say better coordination <laughs> um, well I don't w- would you be more likely to cycle with those Solid barriers, those kind of planters that they're going to put down on that road, for example. I, I think what puts me off about cycling through the city is the the fumes from cars is one of them. Mm. That they are they're not um, continuous. You might get a stretch of good cycle lanes and then it ends abruptly, so it kind of defeats the purpose. And then uh, I have done the Greenway in Mayo, for example, and it's pleasant, but like. It's, it's chalk and cheese, really, the yeah. city and, and doing something like that. So, um, you know, I don't actually think the weather is a is a hindrance at all. I don't think it rains as heavily half as often as we think it does. Um, but the 
but I, I do think there would need to be almost there's a pathway on the highest level and almost a, a lower path for cycling. OK, so infrastructure. And, then, I, 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 and I, then the road is the kind of the lower because one thing cyclists have said to me is that the car wheels kick stones and all sorts yeah. into that cycle lane, which makes the cycle lane almost more dangerous to cycle in than on the road, which is why sometimes they don't use them. Liz, what would you, make you? Well, um, I suppose just getting organised enough to go into a cycle <laughs> shop and buy a bike, <laughs> to be honest. But um, no, the, the infrastructure, I think, is like if you look at places that have put in infrastructure where it is safe to cycle, where you don't have those problems that Scronia was talking about earlier, like people do use them. I lived in Barcelona for a while and they have good cycling infrastructure and mm. I cycled everywhere there. And um, I lived in London and it didn't have such great cycle infrastructure and I didn't cycle there because I felt it was I was taking my life into my hands potentially um, so and if you look at places like Copenhagen everyone cycles there they don't have that dissimilar climate it is drier but um, you know people do use the infrastructure if it's there I think you know yeah. build it and they will come so hopefully the 1.4 billion investment that Eamon Ryan is <laughs> yeah. talking about today will be worth it um, Before I let you go then on the theme of kind of the public realm and safety in the public realm uh, it's kind of a sad uh, marking today it's the two year anniversary of um, Ashing uh, Murphy's death and uh, there was a walk held about an hour and a half ago um, in County Offaly as well to mark the occasion and there was a lot of conversation Grania, around the time of her death up until um, a, a man was charged and then in the, in the aftermath of um, Pushka's conviction as well about the safety in the public realm and how safe mm. women felt in it and, and listen maybe it's kind of unrealistic to expect there to have been changed this quickly when you're talking about culture which is kind of a big ship to turn but I mean has there been any tangible consequence of those conversations from your point of view? No. Um, and as you say, it might be because it will take time. That's why I think anniversaries like this are very important. You know, her her family and I'm sure we're all thinking of what what is, um, I'm sure, an unimaginable grief still for them. Um, the importance of marking the anniversary is to remember that there is still ways we can make um, women feel safer in our society. Um, I was talking to a business about the Dublin riots, for example, and how footfall has not been what it used to be since that happened because people don't feel safe and that the difference purely Gardaí patrolling the area would make. Not that it would actually make the area safer, but it would make people feel mm. safer and that there is value in that in itself, that it doesn't all have to be about figures, but if people see something that makes them feel safer, that is progress or change in itself. And I don't know if authorities value that level of change that is felt by people, but not as tangible in figures as as other measures. Liz, is that the importance of today beyond marking her passing and her family and all those who knew or remembering her is that we don't lose sight of those conversations that were had? Yeah, absolutely. I agree. It's it's really vital. I think there have been some some changes which are positive since her death. Um, like obviously at the time, Helen McEntee did speak out about, you know, use that about how important it was to to kind of change this aspect of her society. And from November, the the um, sentence for assault, which is a very common um, crime and domestic violence doubled from five to ten years. There was um, non-fatal strangulation and non-fatal suffocation were brought in as standalone crimes with um, for non-fatal suffocation and strangulation. Um, a sentence of up to a life in prison. Uh, a standalone stalking offence was introduced. The new, the first ever um, domestic abuse statutory agency, CUN, uh, was um, brought into law, like legally um, enacted, I suppose, um, on the first of January. So. So there are, I think there are some changes that are happening and change is too slow. Um, obviously, like education is a big part of it. And, you know, t teaching people young about consent and respect and, um, you know, I think a lot of work will have to be done as well in the online space. Um, you know, obviously the growth of easy access to online porn and things is very worrying when so much of that content is so so violent and um, skewing to young people's minds. It's a big problem to be tackled still, I think.